we come to Psalm 29 together, a song of the king of the storm. Let's read together. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Have you ever seen a word cloud? It's a type of graphical layout which represents the frequency of terms that are used in a piece of writing, shows that via the font size that's being applied to each term. The more that a word is utilized, the larger the word appears in the, in the cloud graphic, while the less frequent words appear smaller. This sort of visual representation can be a quick way of gathering something of the main point of a piece of literature, which is one of the driving considerations that we engage in when we're considering a text and trying to interpret it. What is the author's intended meaning? How is he communicating that meaning to us? What's the overall tone and driving purpose of the writing? While word choice itself isn't everything, for certainly the grammar, putting the words together is intensely important as well as understanding the meaning, um, words that repeat often do help us to identify the main point. Sometimes we can fall victim to tunnel vision, um, even when we're reading the Bible, right, where we can miss the big picture because we become so focused in on the smaller one. I mean, certainly details are important and they're good. Don't get me wrong. We spend a lot of time with little portions of scripture here and there. But we must not miss the forest for the trees. We must keep the larger context in mind while we interpret smaller portions of scripture. So as you glance through the entire psalm here, of Psalm 29, what words jump out at you? Quite a few words are repeated in this short song of praise, which made me curious as to what a word cloud might look like if it was based upon this psalm. And wouldn't you know, the internet has some free software that can create word clouds for you out of any input text. So can you make a quick guess by looking at Psalm 29, which words should show up most prominently in our word cloud? Aside from the articles and prepositions and pronouns and conjunctions, which words here, uh, key words, happen repeatedly? Take a look at it for just a moment. I hope that as you look at this text and just glance at it, the word Lord just shines on the text. 18 times the word Lord is utilized here. Next to that, the next most often word used is voice, having seven occurrences, and then glory, having four, and then the word ascribe, which we see in verses one and two, three times. King, strength, breaks, makes, shakes, cedars, Lebanon, waters, wilderness, and people all happen two times each, which leaves us with the single occurrence words in this text. Mighty, powerful, majestic, holy, peace, name, God, sits, forever, temple, give, bless, worship, thunders, flames, fire, flood, pieces, strip, forests, bear, skip, calf, young, wild, ox, deer, Syrian, Kadesh. And the word cloud that the internet freely made for me looks like this. Pretty cool, huh? You see how the words that happen most often are larger here, right? So you should, as you're looking at this, you should see the word Lord is very, very prominent. Then you see at the bottom right there, the word voice. And then you see also the words ascribe and glory, right? So Lord, voice, glory, ascribe. Those words happen the most here in the text. 
And it's a pretty cool exercise to try out when if you're studying the Bible to do a word study like this, to break out each word being used and consider the meaning of each term and then count how many times those terms happen within the text. And then ask yourself, how does this term contribute to my understanding of what's going on? Isn't it fascinating that just breaking this psalm out into its component parts causes the main thrust of this song to come into focus? This is certainly a song of adoration. The voice of the Lord is exalted. We ascribe unto the Lord the glory that is due his name. We recognize his splendor and the, his holy array and proclaim his greatness. This psalm declares the Lord's sovereignty over nature. The Lord's voice is powerful. And it's, it's as if he's thinking about a thunderstorm and lightning strikes. And he, as he's thinking of this, he Describes that this is like the Lord's voice being powerful and majestic and strong, shaking the wilderness, hewing out flames of fire, thundering in the heavens, breaking the cedars, causing animals to give birth, stripping the forest bare, raining over the waters. You can imagine just lightning storms and the thunders that come from this. Even in our in our day to day, we are we're familiar with just the frightening prospect that is a massive thunderstorm. The Lord sits as king over every event upon this globe. He sat as king over the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. So certainly he sits as king forever. Living as we do in a suburb of Houston, we're no strangers to the power of natural disasters, as they're so called. Years and years of infrastructure and human engineering can be decimated in a matter of moments. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, forest fires, volcanic eruptions, droughts, and floods all have a way of reminding us of just how small we really are. The power unleashed in a short period of time can just simply overwhelm us. And yet over all of these events, the Lord sits as king. Spurgeon said rightly, natural causes, as men call them, are actually God in action. And we must not ascribe power to them, but to the infinite invisible who is the true source of all. There is certainly something scary about natural disasters. You would be a fool not to be intimidated by, intimidated by a tornado or a hurricane or a tsunami or a volcanic eruption. But then there is also present in such displays the power, the greatness of our God. You know, all of these disasters are here as a reminder that the world as it presently exists is not our home. Sin has wrecked the orderly world that God created, and now even creation itself is eagerly groaning for God to bring history to its rightful consummation, awaiting for the new heavens and the new earth, the recreation, when everything is made new. While the forces of nature can be scary, please remember our Lord is king of the storm. Just as there is not one rogue virus, nor is there one rogue wind or rain or fire or flood or earthquake. So the largest forces that make us feel so very small ought to also just direct our attention above to the Lord who sits as king forever and gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. The next time you hear a thunderstorm, the next time you hear lightning and thunder and you even feel the shaking of your own house, think of the power of our God. One lightning storm is nothing compared to the vast array of his power, but at least he gives us a glimpse. Spurgeon said, there's a peculiar terror in a tempest at sea when deep calleth unto deep and the raging sea echoes to the angry sky. No sight more alarming than the flash of lightning around the mast of a ship, and no sound more calculated to inspire reverent awe than the roar of the storm. The children of heaven have often enjoyed the tumult with humble joy peculiar to the saints, and even those who know not God have been forced into unwilling reverence while the storm has lasted. So ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. As Spurgeon said, he who wings the unerring bolt will give to his redeemed the wings of, angel, of eagles. He who shakes the earth with his voice will terrify the enemies of his saints and give his children peace. 
Why are we weak when we have divine strength to flee to? Why are we troubled when the Lord's own peace is ours? Jesus is the mighty God. Jesus, the mighty God, is our peace. What a blessing is this today. Dear reader, is not this a noble psalm to be sung in stormy weather? Can you sing amid the thunder? It seems fitting to close with reciting the words of the well-known hymn, O Worship the King. O worship the King, all glorious above. O gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O tell of his might, O sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunderclouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. The earth with its store of wonders untold, almighty thy power hath founded of old. Established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it hath cast like a mantle the sea. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. O measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship thee above, the humbler creation, though feebler their lays, with true adoration shall all sing thy praise.